Maharaj, assembled monks, scholars, academics, students. It is always a enormous privilege to speak at a seminar of this kind with its range and focus, but a particular honor to be at the Ram Krishna Mission. Aapna de Shabai ke Shrutaji. This is truly one of the great humanitarian institutions of the world. Because as so often said and insisted upon by Swami Vivekananda, if there is one route to that horizon called the future, then that route is through education. Along with that, he stressed the great importance of gender emancipation as one of the founding principles of modernity. And I may add that at least in my knowledge, he was the very first person to do so. Very first person to do so. One of the great misfortunes of our country, of our society, has been that he left us too early. If he had fought, uh, if he had led the way alongside Gandhiji, we may yet have seen an even better 1947 than we saw. The theme of our conference today is the development of India's foreign policy since 1947. 1947 was a birth year. But as should be commonly known and commonly understood, every birth has a pregnancy story. We cannot understand the trajectory of a foreign policy without understanding what happened in the previous 30 years. And the in the previous 30 years, before 1947, the world and world history changed as never before. And when I use the term never before, I use it consciously. I do not use it as exaggeration. There was a fundamental change in the <clears throat> making, not only of the geopolitics of the world, but also the patterns of power which shaped human existence. What happened in these years? By 1918, after World War I, the most significant in historical terms consequence of World War I was not the shift of power between the, the antagonistic forces from one side of Europe to the other, but a fact that was not immediately recognized, but which rose sharply in the consciousness of the world very, very quickly after that. World War I was not a war fought all over the world. Its main battlefields were Europe, but its consequences were worldwide. And what were this, the principal consequence of that? That war marked a watershed moment because it ended the age of empires. There was no empire left after World War I. A process that had begun a hundred years before that. It was not in history, actually, a generation disappears in a blink of an eye. For a hundred years, the political formations that had created whatever stability existed had been created alongside the geopolitics of empires. But suddenly, World War I marked 
I mean, I'll, I'll just give you a brief example. I don't think we have sufficient time to go into more details. But you can see, actually, the process begins in Latin America with the Simon Bolivar movement and its challenge to Spain. And then quickly takes on many other dimensions. In fact, I wonder that if in 1857, Indians had defeated the British, then legitimately, logically, uh, India would have been in the forefront of this movement, but we had to wait for 100 years or 90 years more. But between the Bolivarist movement and 1918, every single empire disappeared. The Japanese, I'm just going not in chronological order, but in simply in spatial order. The Japanese, the Chinese, the Indian, the Tsarist, the Ottoman, the Persian, the German, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, every single empire began to disappear from the from the world. And what we was left was of course the leftover was the age of colonization. That didn't end. But what did begin in 1918? and 1919-1920 was the challenge to colonization. The challenge to colonization was experienced in four great public movements. Of course we know of our public movement, the non-cooperation movement uh, and uh, or the Khilafat movement or whatever you might want to call it. But in Indonesia there was a similar movement. In Iraq there was a similar movement. In Egypt there was a similar movement. Everywhere the people were rising up. Now what was unique? What was unique to the challenge to colonization? Previous empires had been defeated, including in World War I, by other empires. But the challenge to colonization did not come from governments. It came from a new formation, a new existence, and a new reality which shaped the 20th century, and that was the power of the people. Gandhi was the first among those who led a movement based on mass, on raising the mass mobilization. The importance of this is understood only if you see the relationship between mass mobilization and the formation and the next formation of political space. Because from here emerges something that we now take for granted, which is the nation state. The nation state begins to come into its own after 1918 and becomes the defining or it becomes the basic building block of the architecture, again, I would use only comparative stability because stability by itself is still unknown. But comparative stability of the architecture of the 20th century. And from these movements, I am not disclosing secrets, but I am very tempted to say that when Gandhiji began his movement, uh, Lord Sina, whose name is still along the road, and he was just speaking conventionally, I don't blame him, because that was what the conventional wisdom was. Lord Sinha was, I think, then the law member of the Viceroy's Council. And when Gandhiji came, he famously said, he said, what does this man in a dhoti think he is doing? The British Empire will last 400 years. But when the British Empire met the challenge, not of Sultans, not of Maharajas, not of Nawabs, not of Kings, but met the challenge of the people, this empire, which was supposed to last for 400 years, could not last for more than 30. It disappeared within 30 more years. That was the meaning of this new storm. Mass mobilization and nations built on the basis of popular will were in fact logical, logical components of a larger movement and a larger the 
India's sense of itself and the foreign policy of the Indian freedom movement was founded, therefore, on a challenge to colonization. And colonization by itself, of course, has to mean that uh, it was a foreign power. It so happened that in our case, the foreign power was British. <coughs> Colonization was, is qualitatively different from the age of empire, because the age of empire still retained a vested interest in the local economy. Because the kings and the Maharajas and whoever it is were never antagonistic to the local economy. Colonization was the transfer of resources from the colony to the mother country. That was the great difference. According to the rise and fall of nation states, Paul Kennedy, Paul Kennedy teaches at Yale University. According to him, in 1750, 1750, India had 24% of world manufacturing output. 24%. Do you know that almost every name for cloth used across the world comes from Bengal? Where do you find it? Go to a very interesting book called Hobson Jobson's Dictionary. And there it is recorded. Because all the best cloth was, was made here. And this had been part of a history for a very long time. Livy's history of Rome, when he writes about Julius Caesar's time, he says that there is an Indian bazaar in Rome. And he weeps. He says that the ladies of Rome are wasting the gold we have conquered from elsewhere and sending it to India in return for silk. That was the strength of Indian manufacture and Indian trade. And why would the Portuguese come down, just down this river to Bandel, where I think uh, you studied near Mohsen College, uh, closely followed by the Dutch, and then followed by the French, and then followed by Danes, and then followed by others. The English, of course, came last. Nobody comes to conquer a poor country. Who wants to conquer a poor country? The conquest must be worth the investment that you make on the army. So this massive transfer of wealth that took place was the basis of many of the components of Indian foreign policy, uh, where a stand against colonization and the first cousin or the, or the direct child of colonization, which is neo-colonization, formed the basis of the first but there was a very significant departure which could have only emerged from India. You know, the same syndrome which asked the question, how do you defeat the British? After all, this was the basic question which entangled the minds of Swami Vivekananda of, of uh, that generation that preceded the generation that controlled the fortunes of the 19th century. And the first inklings, how I wish that Gandhiji had met uh, Swamiji in here, right here, when he came here in 1902 to meet him, but found that Swamiji was ill and had moved to his Calcutta house and could not. But the first inklings of change emerged, the stirrings of a great new idea emerged out of here. And what was this? that India could defeat the British not with the help of British ideas, not with the help of armies, but with the, yes, with the power of something uniquely Indian, and that was Ohinja. And it stunned the world to discover that the mightiest empire known to man could be felt by an idea that nobody had had the courage to discover before or to be inspired by before. But the, the important for our purposes today is that the first 
the first philosophical philosophical basis of India's foreign policy was to give flesh to the collateral components of independence. We had to protect the independence and foreign policy was an extremely important part of this protection. And this got enunciated soon enough in 1946 at the Asian Relations Conference that was held in India where we began the leadership of the anti-colonial or the removal of colonization. But what was uniquely Indian about it was that we challenged the British, but we never hated the British. We took a clear distinction between the people of Britain and indeed and the operational tactics of the British state or even the objectives of the British state. And that is why uniquely Gandhi could be cheered when he goes to Manchester in 1931 and 30, or 32, I think 31. And this was extremely important because the bitterness of colonization never translated into a foreign policy reality. Today, the distance between Algeria and France is still large. Memories are still very powerful. But in our case, we became members of the Commonwealth in the hope that a new future could be found through a humanitarian philosophy for the world. Of course, there were skeptics who never understood what philosophy had to do with foreign policy. But at least we retained our, we retained our focus, we retained our bearings. This was manifested in Panchila. This was manifested in Bantu. The trouble was, this was manifested in Indigeni Bhai Bhai. This was manifested in relations that India had in its first 15 years with almost every country in the world. The only country with which we had a problem was a country to our west, which emerged not out of a philosophy of independence, but out of a culture of dependence. The struggle for Pakistan was founded on dependence of British rule, and this was quickly reflected in their foreign policy almost immediately after they got their freedom. But there is a reason for that. There were two inheritances, therefore, on the subcontinent. We inherited the ideas of the Indian freedom movement. Our neighbor to the West inherited the ideas and the thinking of the British colonial presence. They were still fighting. The, they immediately joined the Cold War. They immediately joined the relationships that were designed to continue war by other means. The 1950s where that decade or those 15 years were an era when just about everything, at least in foreign policy terms, if not in economic terms, seemed to fit into place and an emerging new world but it didn't last. To cut a long story short, both, both, uh, well, Bandung in principle, Panchil at its heart, uh, disappeared effectively with the 1962 war. 1962 war ended what might we call the mark the end of the dream phase of our foreign policy. And very soon, very soon, the idea 
that non-alignment was also there was also one of the fundamental pillars by which we, through which we could shape the world began to be by the 1980s and 1990s. I mean, it was obvious that non-alignment works only when there is alignment. When one pillar of alignment disappears, then it takes away also the space in between, even if it leads a little chaos in the center. The years of not uncertainty, but I am always reminded of Matthew Arnold's uh, famous phrase, Matthew Arnold, for those who may not be aware, was a rather obscure English poet. I mean, most of whose writing deserves obscurity. But at least he said one very sharply brilliant thing, which is one world is dead and the other is born. And in that space of fog, Nations continued foreign policy, but purely as pragmatic <coughs> equations, which were nation-based. Nation <coughs> they found that multilateral bodies also, <coughs> particularly the United Nations, seemed to promise far more than they could deliver. It was in this process that we made our second and dramatically significant assertion. It was made by the Vajpayee government when we decided that if the two basic components or the driving motivations of foreign policy are the security of the state and the prosperity of the nation, this is what uh, foreign policy really is or should be all about, then India had to join the nuclear powers. And the moment we went public with our, with, uh, our nuclear power, our presence and our place in the world changed. That change had to be tested. And that test could only occur through time. But India negotiated the post-nuclear phase of its foreign policy with great confidence with the confidence that sometimes its economic situation might not have necessarily deemed very wise. Never forget that in 1991, uh, we had to send our gold to London as collateral for debt. Despite that, the assertion of India as a, na as a nation which had begun to discover the contours of its destination in the 21st century began to emerge in the consciousness of the world. Economic reforms propelled this forward as well. People realized that India's search for security and prosperity was now at last on a significant footing. Every century has its critical moments. This century's critical moments for us and I think for the world revolved around 9-11 in America and the huge consequences and the Mumbai terrorist attack. These two events, more than anything else, defined for the world a, an old aphorism. Ever since the Shastras described peace till today, the meaning of peace has not changed. The meaning of peace is still the same. You have just chanted the verses that define peace. It is the meaning of war that keeps changing. And the world discovered that now war had taken a dimension that was unprecedented. A dimension through terrorism that was not merely the most menacing form of war that we had seen, 
but it is also morally repulsive and an evil, an evil that challenged the very existence of mankind. Now, why do I make this point that it challenged the existence of mankind? Or if I took a poll just now, I think 90% of you, 95% of you would say that the real challenge to existence is nuclear threat. That if nuclear war breaks out, everything will be obliterated. So why do I call terrorism the larger existential threat? Because <coughs> terrorism, terrorism challenges us not through the prospect of death, but by destroying, by destroying the humanity that binds relationships within societies, within human beings, and within the collection of nation states. Why? What are the objective of terrorists? They first they challenge the nation state itself. They do not believe that nations been created through the popular will. And a popular will defined through culture, defined through language in many places, defined through geography in some others, whatever historical facts. Every nation has a history which goes beyond the boundaries of memory. Only very limited and nations which fail have a starting point to memory. Only nations. We in India are the sum total of all our histories. And that is the strength and beauty of our people. But they challenge the nation state because they believe that political space should be defined by religion and not by poverty. And they destabilize the nation state through a weapon whose power is increasingly being recognized every day in bits and pieces or on a large scale. That they divide not simply nations, but they divide human beings, neighborhoods, through that poison of fear and suspicion. And once fear and suspicion take over man, then all you get is social chaos. You do not get, you do not get the harmony through which we can move from one point to the head. There is no future in chaos. So this is an extreme danger which fortunately people are beginning to realize. The Today, the conflicts that rage across the world are not simply the conflicts of violence, they are conflicts of ideology. They are conflicts between those like us who believe in faith equality as the basis, as a fundamental basis of constitution and behavior. I have to uh, remind people, and I'm always happy to do so all over the world, that uh, the, every morning in India begins with the Azan, it is followed by the, by the temple bells of a Hanuman temple, followed by the recitation of the, of the Granth Sahib in a Gurdwara, followed on Sundays by the church bells. This is not because in 1950 we adopted a constitution. This has been going on for thousands of years, or as long as every faith came in. We are a faith equality society and a faith equality people, not because our constitution gave it to us. We gave the constitution based on our laws. But today the fight is between those who believe in faith equality and those who believe in faith supremacy. And that is what you see in the various Salafist and Jihadist and Islamist movements. 
that they are create these are votaries of those who believe that you know only one faith is a viable option, which in a large comedy of nations is extremely, I mean, extremely is a, is a not sustainable proposition apart from being completely immoral. So the challenge before our foreign policy as well as, well as our domestic policy is how to awaken the world to these emerging realities and how to get unity among the world. If, and you will see how much in the last three years, how much in the last three years, the intense effort to raise international awareness about the dangers, both the ideological and well the physical dangers of terrorism has created how much of an impact that the Prime Minister Narendra Modi's intense effort has led to such rewarding results. It is not simply that today America has now made this a part of its frontline policies, non-negotiable. But look at the BRICS statement, the joint statement that emerged out of BRICS and emerged out of uh, from the uh, from uh, from a meeting point in China, where it roundly and categorically condemned this. So to understand the nature of conflict, to find solutions to it, obviously has to be a great objective of any foreign policy. Second, on security. We often say, and this is how we explain it, that when we in India say that we have a defense ministry, we actually believe in the word that we use. We have a defense ministry. We do not have an offense ministry. We do not use our military resources to intrude, to invade, to occupy. On the other hand, we understand the meaning of defense. And the meaning of defense is not one inch of our land will be compromised, not one Indian shall lose his life without someone being held accountable. The defense and security of the citizen and of our country and of our land is paramount. And I can tell you that this message is striking, is getting massive endorsement from the world. Because this people understand that it is a very mature position. You can see over and over again, I would not uh, like to be specific, but over and over again, when we hold our ground, the Prime Minister makes it clear that we will hold our ground. We do have no desire to be covetous, but on the other hand, we have absolutely, absolutely will not neither appear nor be weak. And this, if accompanied by the maturity of silence, you know, people hear silence as well, raises the understanding of what we are all about. <clears throat> it is our objective that we let the 20th century in only one aspect. Let's be truthful. We let the 20th century in the great struggle against colonization. Colonization began in India, and the day colonization died in India, colonization as a project disappeared. After 1947, it was not possible to hold on to Africa. It was not possible to hold on to India because if you, if the jewels in the crown 
had been lost by London, then the other artifacts were not going to be able to remain in their control. But the challenge this year, in this century, if the last century was the century of the nation state, this century is going to be the century of sovereignty. The nation state created the basis of assertions of sovereignty. And sovereignty means that there are no big nations and small nations. There are equal nations. Sure. Every nation does not have the same capacity. It would be very foolish to suggest so. Capacity itself is a dynamic. Our capacities 10 years ago, even our Indian capacities 10 years ago, were not the same as our capacities today. So capacities change, but rights do not change. Obligations do not change. Duties do not change. In the fraternity of nations, the right to equality does not change. There was a phase in which an oppressive empire was replaced by what can be called theoretically the idea of a benevolent empire. But even that benevolent empire, uh, the empire part of it quickly destroyed the benevolent part. Nations have emerged at a rapid pace towards the last 25, last 25 of the century with an equal pace that they emerged in the second quarter of the last century. But this year, this century, will be an assertion of sovereignty. It will also be an assertion of prosperity. In the 20th century, prosperity was defined by growth. Now, prosperity will be defined by growth plus something else. It will be defined by growth in which the resources of growth are spread, are spread as a right, not as a not as a donation, are spread to the poorest, to the poor at the fastest. The wealth of a nation will not be measured by the treasury. The wealth of a nation will be measured by how much, with what level you have eliminated, by, by, by whether you have eliminated poverty or not, by whether you have changed the quality of lives of the poor or not, by whether you have turned women from being a second class citizen, frankly, not worse. That is what historically we have turned women into. To whether they are going to get an equal place in the vanguard of progress or not. And if you see the latest statistics which are now emerging, you find fascinating reality. I will give you just one mudra. I don't know how many of you know about Mudra or not. And if you don't know about it, then I'm actually very happy. Because Mudra is a program meant for the poor. For those hundreds of millions, Swamiji, who dream of entering this world, but are not able. They are also there. They are there in Bhadreshwar, where I was born. They are there in Delhi Park. For them, this hall is part of their fantasy. <laughs> and mudra is meant for them. Some 90 million, 90 million people now have taken these collateral free loans for very small businesses. Ponga Varavarjan, sewing machines, Chicken farming, means of livelihood. <coughs> 
78% of those who have taken these loans are women. There is a massive, massive revolution taking place whose consequences we will see only five years later. Because, my friends, the difference between investing in men and investing in women is actually very, very simple. If you invest in men, you invest in a salary. You invest in women, you will invest in the future. Why do I say this? Because I cannot think. I have it has been privileged in my present job and even in my previous incarnations to travel intensively across the world. I have gone to just about everywhere except Antarctica and, and, and Arctic. And that to Arctic I came close to. But uh, you can go to anywhere in the world, any religion, any color, any ethnicity, any religion, heaven knows any difference. And you will never find a mother who will eat before she has fed her children. You cannot find it. Not possible. Not possible. On the other hand, every father will turn up and say, Hone Dektuna, That's that's a fact. Let's accept it. But the men have been in charge of the economy. And you will not get transformation until we change the balance of power. Until we get economic emancipation. This is what Swamiji said. He said it in a metaphor. Then give me 50 women and I will get freedom. Give me 5,000 men and I'll have to still struggle. So, what I am broadly saying is that there is a great surge that is taking place under the leadership of the present Prime Minister, who is actually breaking glass ceilings, which have trapped us for so long. The trouble is that there are very, very, very strong vested interests who would want to retain those glass It's not easy. It's not easy to break them. Well, on a, not the subject of this talk, but one of the biggest glass ceilings is tax compliance. People don't want to pay tax. And you can't get the resources required for poverty elimination without an honest society in which we all contribute. So anyway, the point is that we are creating our objectives, our national objectives clearly are, the, are around security and prosperity. And our foreign policy is geared around these two fundamental objectives. The economic partnerships and relationships that we are building are literally the most important bridges in our interconnectivity. Our Interconnectivity with the Arab world now is phenomenal. It is built on an increasingly shared comprehension of where the problem lies and where the opportunity lies. We have now a remarkable reality. You know, another uh, actor borrow problem that. Uh, Unless the news is bad, it doesn't get uh, it doesn't get space. We must be the only country. Must be I can't say for certain, but probably are the only country which has friendships and partnerships across binaries. Okay, I'm not going to mention names, but you think about it. It's because people know that we have no vested interest and no intrusive interest. We have a self-interest, of course we have a self-interest. Why should we not have a self-interest? But we have reasonable and rational ways of trying to achieve it. We understand, as the Prime Minister has said, 
that the best form of prosperity is shared prosperity. The first sharing is internal. The second sharing is with partners across the world. There is no insular prosperity. And it is these interlinkages that propel us. We urge very strongly that if the world wants to believe in, in multilateral institutions, then it must understand that the world in which institutions like the United Nations were born have been replaced by a world of 2017 and 2018. The five victors of World War II cannot con continue to control the decision making across the world uh, through the veto power. You know, power is not the right to give orders. Power is the ability to have them obeyed. And if the power of the Security Council becomes impotent because it has become irrelevant, then it is not the world which will change, but the Security Council will collapse. I said the other day, in, I don't often give interviews, but in an interview in BBC, I said, you know, 2030, we'll also see the 100th anniversary of one institution whose name everyone has forgotten. It's called the League of Nations. Does the United Nations want to become another League of Nations? If it doesn't, it had better start changing itself right away. Otherwise, who will remember? Does anyone remember the League of Nations? So, in this search for a cogent, logical, principle, after all, to draw very strict red lines against intrusion is based on principles. To tell the world, including our neighborhood, that we are always ready to talk, we are always desirous of peace. But we will talk peace only when the environment is peaceful. We will never be blackmailed. It's an extremely important message. To the east of you, not too far away from here, is Bangladesh. With Bangladesh, we have sorted out a problem that seemed intractable for 70 years. How did we do it? We did it because both sides decided the rational way forward is peaceful. It is this message we keep giving over and over. That we will not tolerate any, any attempt to create success around that mirage, dangerous mirage called violence. It is This objective, this philosophy, this view of the world that sustains the current application of our foreign policy, I would just want to leave you with one thought. If you stand in Delhi and look east, you will see a very interesting range of nations. Nations from Nepal, Bangladesh, some are Hindu, some are Muslim, some are Buddhist, some are Christian, and in fact the largest nation is atheist, Shinto. Just about every faith, really, uh, or most faiths of the world, are present in this conglomeration. But there is one thing in common in the A to our East, including China and Japan. That by and large, by and large, everyone is searching for economic growth, for stability, and for a slightly better life for them. If you look to the West, you find something startlingly different. You have to count on the fingers of one hand how many governments 
are totally in charge of their geography. It doesn't mean that where governments are not in charge, there is a vacuum. Politics, like nature, was a vacuum. Somebody is in charge there, if the government is not. It may be a militia, maybe something else. As you have seen in ISIS, seen in Taliban, the war between such forces of chaos and destabilization continues, ebbs and rises. But the opportunity for prosperity, I'm not saying it's an absolute fact, there are islands of which are different. But this is the time when nations which believe in peace and prosperity have to, have to mobilize, have to mobilize into partnerships that can both destroy the menace and assure that the 21st century does not fall victim to the to the abysmal to the abysmal conflicts of the 20th. That is the challenge before us. But like all challenges, the real and ultimate challenge is at home, which is how to create, turn our country into a country that is not powerful only by the strength of arms, but is powerful because its people, its people have put the hunger that was bequeathed to us by colonization, finally defeated that, have given opportunities that there is a college and a hall like this for every single Indian. That is the dream that should inspire everyone, but most of all, inspire any institution created by Swami Vivekananda. Thank you all very much.